and welcome. I'm Bonnie Libhart. You're watching Vision Plus. Without a vision, the people perish. And today you're going to meet a person, Iris Mail. And if you know of someone that has ever had an affair and maybe still feels guilty about it, perhaps this is the day that you can be healed from that. Or if you know that person, give them a call right now and you just, I believe that you're going to be blessed so much. I have been. She's made me cry already. I'm just about to lose my false eyelashes, ruin my makeup, and start running down my face. Oh, wouldn't that be terrible? I'm so glad you joined us. And I want you now to meet Iris. Uh, welcome to Victory Network and Vision Plus. Now, you are a person who's a senior program manager. I'm impressed with that title. <laughs> that, that, uh, does business seminars, I manage business, manage seminars. business seminars. You're under contract, you have your own business, but you're under contract with Career Track, right. which a lot of people are going to be in Huntsville about the time this is going on the air. And of course, they're in so many places all around the world mm -hmm. that uh, this particular one, we'll go ahead and let you say, though you didn't know I was going to ask you this, where is it held here? It's going to be held at the Hilton here. Uh, and the title will be Professional Image. It's an all-woman seminar. All right. That sounds fun. I'm going to hardly wait. We'll go. Now, your husband is Chuck. Right. And he is, a re did he retire? He retired last fall. Uh -huh. uh, he had worked for the government in computers for many, many years, had been in law enforcement before that. And a law enforcement computer guy. I tell you, if you can't catch him one way, he'll catch him another right. way. <laughs> now has his own computer business. Right. Mm -hmm. And possibly will be doing some other things, too. Possibly. Both of you are very active in the Arab Christian Church and the full gospel. Uh, probably not as active as we'd like to be at this point. I'm but, on the road so much with my job, but mm -hmm. yes. And sometimes he sneaks away and goes with you, doesn't he? Sometimes he does, yes. <laughs> That's fun, isn't it? You travel all of Alabama and Georgia, don't right. you? Mm -hmm. uh, now you have, how many children do you have? We have seven all together. We have a yours, mine, and ours family. I've always heard the jokes. Mm. Hey, Mom. My kids and your kids are fighting our Picking kids. Picking on our kids, right. <laughs> right. Well, sometimes that happens, yeah. too. And so are you fairly newlywed with Chuck? Oh, yeah. We're newlyweds of about 30 years. 30 <laughs> years. How about that? So you had the yours and his uh, a while ago, and you're only 33. A long time so ago. Right. Yeah. Right. There you go. <laughs> I was a child bride. Right. Of course. Well, you two met. How did you get going to... Uh, Arab Christian Center. Well, I feel like the Lord really led us there. Um, I grew up in Alabama and moved away when I first got married and hadn't really lived back here in many, many years. And we were planning to move back when he retired. And I prayed, Lord, we need a spirit-filled church that really meets our needs and that we can be useful in. And we knew there was a Liberty Church around and we went looking for it and we found it. And we knew we were home when we walked in the door. You didn't have to look anymore. We didn't have huh? to look anymore, no. That's, that's always a good feeling, it isn't it? It surely is. Now, yeah. how has it worked, and how did it happen that you have seven children? How has it worked, stepmothers and stepbrothers? And... Well, fortunately for our sanity, they're all grown and away from home and on their own. Uh, it was very difficult sometimes when they were at home. Stepchildren can be very difficult um, for either, either the man or the woman. Um, so it, it had... It's a testament to us and to the Lord that we survived it, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to spend some time just going through that. But since I've given everybody a little teasing about what happened, tell me about uh, how, this, how it led up to you having seven children by well, his and yours and ours. About 30 years ago, 31 years ago, Chuck and I met and we fell in love. Uh, I was his secretary. Uh, right here in Huntsville, Alabama, as a matter of fact. I've heard of you, girl. How about that? <laughs> yeah. uh, unfortunately, we were both married to somebody else at the time. Uh, neither of us were Christians. We had an affair, um, a prolonged affair. I got a divorce real quickly, and he didn't. But he had children, and I had children. Um, we eventually got a divorce, or he eventually got a divorce, and we eventually got married. Before that, we had a child. I had a child before we were married, which I gave away. There's um, 
There's a nicer way to say that. I gave her up for adoption. But to me, I gave her away. And I can't tell you how, how that hurt me. I'm not against adoption today, but I can't tell you it ripped out my heart. If someone had cut open my chest and pulled out my heart, it wouldn't have hurt anymore. But God was there then, even then, even though I didn't really know him. I prayed for her, um, and, and I gave her away. I prayed that God would put her in a home where she'd be loved. And then I tried to put my life back together again. Eventually we got married and we had another child. So we grew up, my kids grew up, with there being six in the family, um, which were still yours, mine, and ours. And our daughter, who was, would have been 20 years old in 1981, came back to us. God brought her back to us. How did that happen? Well, a, a miracle. That, there's no other way to describe it. She's my miracle. And I wrote a song uh, called My Miracle about, about my daughter. But um, God put a hunger in her heart to know us. He helped her to find us. She was one of the first people in the state of Tennessee that was able to get her court records opened. Um, and she had no idea what she was going to find. She got a lot of discouragement from family and friends because she could be opening a real can of worms. Um, mothers weren't always happy about uh, adopted kids showing up on their doorstep. So it took her several months after she got the records open to get up the nerve to call. And I had given accurate information in the files. And finally she got up the nerve one night and she picked up the phone and she called my parents in Gunnersville. My mother did not know anything about her, um, so Dixie just took a deep breath and told her all the information she knew. She was afraid she'd hang up on her and gave her all the information she had, and mother was smart enough to know that way back then, uh, at that point 20 years ago, she would have been my husband's, my now husband's child. And so she gave her my phone number and address, and I lived in uh, Missouri at the time, or lived in Virginia at the time. We had just moved to Virginia from Missouri. And so she called us. Uh, it was coincidence, I suppose, though I don't believe in coincidence, but she called us on Valentine's Day. Hmm. And she didn't even realize it was Valentine's Day. She was so excited about calling us. And um, I was at church that night, and Chuck was at home and had taken the phone call. And there's another, there's all kinds of little stories involved in this story that, that you don't really have time for today. But. Well, I can take one or two of them. How come him at church, at home? Well, he was at home because he'd been fasting on and off for three weeks. The Lord had led him on a very specific fast uh, over a period of three weeks. Not a, not a full three-week fast, but so many days a week now, for three weeks. Now, when you say specific, he didn't know what... He didn't know what he was fasting was for, but the Lord said to fast. I believe the first week was one day a week for three weeks. And so he did that just in obedience. You know, the word says obedience is better than sacrifice. He did that. And at the end of that three weeks, the Lord said, no, this was a nine week. The Lord said, now I want you to fast for two days a week for three weeks. So he did that. And then the Lord said, I want you to fast three days a week for three weeks. So he did that. And he's expecting, Lord, I'm not going to weigh very much, you know, if I keep all this fasting. And at the end of the, the three weeks that he had fasted three days a week, the Lord didn't say anything. So he knew that the fast was over with. So he went to church, it ended on a Sunday, and he went to church that Sunday morning expecting heavens to open and the angels to be sitting there. He knew that his fast was over with, so he knew something miraculous was going to happen. And it was just your average Sunday morning at church. And he just went home real disappointed. So that night, Sunday night, Valentine's night, 1981, he was a little aggravated with God because here he'd been fasting all this time and nothing happened. And he was just sure something was going to happen. Well, something did happen. So God had him at home when the phone call came. Otherwise, we would both have been at church. And, and you felt an urgency to I was at church home. and I felt a real strong urging to go home, to leave immediately. I didn't have a sense of foreboding that anything was wrong. I just felt like I had to get home. I don't think I've ever had that kind of feeling before or after. Um, so I left church and went home. And I got home and Chuck had me sit down and told me that our daughter had called. And I wish I could tell you that I was happy and excited and everything was wonderful. Um, but I had all the guilt 
and all the pain and all the shame that I'd been bottling down inside me for 20 years just erupted like a volcano. And I felt like the lowest worm under the carpet. My thought was, why would she possibly want to talk to me? I gave her away. What sh could she possibly, why would she possibly want to talk to me? You see, when I got saved, I was not a Christian when she was born, but when I got saved, the very first thing I did was ask God to forgive me for giving my daughter away. And He did. When I received the baptism, I asked God to forgive me. And He already had. And on numerous occasions, every time I thought about her, I asked Him to forgive me. But you see, He forgave me the very first time I asked, but I didn't accept that forgiveness. I didn't realize that He had already forgiven me. So for about two weeks after she called, God and I did some real serious cleanup work on the inside of me. Because anything you bury on the inside, it just festers and gets worse. So he cleaned up all those old hurts. And I went through a healing of the memories like you wouldn't believe. How did he heal those hurts? And how did you go through a healing of the memories? Well, he just healed them. He brought them all up. And I guess I suffered through all of them again. And he washed them in the blood of Jesus. I didn't have anybody lay hands on me and pray. I just sort of got off by myself um, with me and God. I did a lot of praying. Um, I did a lot of reading the scriptures. And he really showed me that he had already forgiven me. I had to forgive myself, and I had to accept his forgiveness. How was your mother and dad, who did not know that they had another granddaughter, how did she cope with it? Well. My parents were not spirit-filled Christians. They had been in the Methodist Church for many, many years, and this was very difficult for them. Um, easier in the 80s, probably, than it would have been in the 60s. And I think Mother was a little bit hurt because I hadn't come to her at the time and said, I need your help. Uh, I had taken care of everything all on my own, and um, I think she felt like well, as any mother would, you wish your daughter would turn to you. Um, but they accepted her just like their other grandchildren. How and they about loved your her. other children? Now you had six other family children. Um, one being a full brother. One being a full brother, and none of them knew anything about her. The next morning, I couldn't do anything that night. I was a basket case. The next morning, we had two sons living at home. The oldest one who was Chuck's son, and the youngest one of the whole brood, who was our son. And we sat them down and we told them about Dixie. Did you get the other four with the, the others two? Were, no, the others away. were far away. Um, so I wrote letters and two. I called the mm -hmm. others. I, I wrote, wrote a long letter how to each one. How did you tell them? With great difficulty. Um, we just said, you know, 20 years ago, at that point it was 20 years ago, we made a mistake, and I told him just the way I told you, uh, with a lot more tears, I might add. I don't cry about it so much anymore. Um, I've told this story a few times, and like I said, God has healed. I don't hurt anymore. Uh, he didn't take the memories away. He just cleaned them up. Um, but we told them, uh, and we told Asher, that's my youngest son, that this was his sister. And his first words were, wow, my very own sister. He said, you know, all these years, and he was... He was like 18 years old then. He said, all these years, everybody in the family has had their own brother or their own sister. And I was, I was all by myself. I had stepbrothers and half-brothers, or you know, half-brothers and sisters, but I didn't have anybody that was my very own. And she's my very own. When, and, when did you get together with her? It was two weeks after the first phone call. And, my initial feeling was to get in the car the next day. She lived in, in Tennessee, and we lived in Virginia, and it was about a 13-hour drive. And my initial feeling was to get in the car the next day and drive down there. And then... How did you keep yourself from doing that? I really wasn't ready. I really hurt too bad still. Um, I, I had to get rid of those hurts. I had to, I had to get the, the pain, not just the hurt, but the guilt, I think, was the worst the worst and I had to get rid of it I just now my on the other hand you ask about my mother and dad my mother and dad got up the next day and drove to Tennessee oh they did and they met her they met her they and she didn't know they were coming 
um, she was in the process of, of redoing an apartment and they went up well my dad walked in the next morning and told mother I'm going to Tennessee if you want to go get ready and she took pictures off the wall of me and my sons so she and Chuck so she could take them and show Dixie what we looked like and that was Dixie's first introduction as to what we looked like was from the pictures my mother took off the wall so they met her the next day so they really met her before I did um, and we went down in two weeks and spent the weekend with her and then took her back home with us for two weeks how was that first moment of looking at her and meeting her oh. I don't know that I can really describe that because by then God had healed the, the, the pain that I had inside and we had 20 years to catch up on. And I do know that we both talked that day until we absolutely couldn't talk anymore. We sat um, in her little living room, which was not much bigger than this uh, little set here, and she sat on one side and I sat on the other and Chuck kind of sat over in the middle and he just, he just watched back and forth as we talked all day. And I think he probably had a crick in his neck and we just talked until we couldn't talk anymore. So. What were the things that you talked about the most? Probably things that weren't real important. Um, what's your favorite color and what's your favorite flower and, and um, do you like it when it rains or do you like to be out in the sunshine? Silly things that, that getting acquainted. Went getting acquainted. Um, mm -hmm. We didn't really talk about... What did you think about her looks? She looks a great deal like I do. <laughs> yeah. yeah, she's very, very beautiful. She, she is. is extremely beautiful. Yeah. Works with Reba, Reba McIntyre, McIntyre yeah. in Nashville. Right, and she is she is more beautiful than most movie stars. So I hope we get to meet her. I've met her, but I hope that we get to have her on the show sometime. I'm sure she would love it. Uh huh. Um, I had um, I had the pleasure of meeting her adopted family the first weekend we were up How there. did they allow her to do that? Of course, with the court uh, records being open, well, they she couldn't was, keep she her. she was 20 years old. Yeah, they couldn't keep her from, from doing that. Home. But how did they cope with that? That must well, have caused great jealousy, or I don't know if jealousy is the right word. I don't think. Fear of think losing probably, her love. Yeah. Um, her mother, her adopted mother had died before she found us. Oh. Uh, she died of cancer the year before she found us, and she knew that she was looking for us. She was really the only one in the family that knew that Dixie was trying to find us. Oh, not did, even the dad? No, he didn't. Mm -hmm. He was not aware of it. Um, but you see, her, her family, her adopted family, as I was telling you earlier, were friends of my dad's family. My father boarded with her adopted grandmother's family in Gunnersville when he was in high school because years ago it was too far. He lived out in the country and it was too far to travel back and forth. How did so, you find that out? Well, when Dixie called that first night and talked to my mother, she told her what town. She lived in Shelbyville, Tennessee. And mother said, oh, do you know the Phillips in Shelbyville? And Dixie said, well, that's my family, my adopted family. And that was, of course, my family was well acquainted with the Phillips. So when, when I went up there, to see Dixie and when I met them for the first time they knew who I was my maiden name they were well acquainted with my family so they and I think you know God did that for a reason it helped her adopted family accept us because they knew the family and perhaps it helped my family accept her uh, it's just awesome that they could have worked like that but of course that's God that's so God. That, why did she have such a deep desire to find you I don't know except that God, that's got to be God. It's got to be a miracle of God. I've met a lot of people who were adopted since Dixie has come back to us. And some of them are interested in finding their natural parents and some are not. And most of them are bitter. And I would say to the people who were adopted, in, in most cases, there's some kind of circumstances. That mother didn't reject you because she didn't love you. I, my, mine certainly wasn't a lack of love for Dixie. I just, I was trapped in a situation in 1961. You didn't bring uh, a child into the world without being married. It just wasn't done. Today, our world is a different place, but not 30 years ago. How uh, is she 
Uh, how is the relationship now with you We and probably have a better relationship now than we would have had if I had raised her um, because we're very much alike. Um, she has some of my, my husband's personality and, and, and she's a lot like him, but she's a great deal like me. A lot like you? A great deal like me. And, uh, in what way? Well, she's a tiny bit stubborn. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, just, just so much of her personality. Things that it's real interesting, um, not habits almost, that you think uh, become habits, but obviously are inherited, at least in her case. Uh, the way we hold our hands, uh, the way we gesture when we talk. Um, we sing together sometimes, and we, I love to sing, but our voices blend just perfectly. so perfectly, like God made mm -hmm. them to go together. Um, th this is a miracle of God. What if someone is watching and would like to get in touch with theirs? How do they go about starting that process? Well, there are agencies now that will uh, help them. I don't know the name. As a matter of fact, Dixie is involved with one of them in Nashville. But there are agencies, and it's easier to do now, even than it was 10 years ago. She could probably be willing to help. I'm sure she mm -hmm. would. Um, there are a lot of uh, states now that are allowing their court records to be opened also. Do you know what the status is in Alabama? I don't. Mm -hmm. I really don't. And so that'd just be something they'd just have to call the courthouse to start there, I suppose, and yeah. they'll tell them where to go from there. But if it's Tennessee, then you, you have a better It's chance. Tennessee. I know the records. You do have to go to court to have it done, or at least you did when she had hers open 10 years ago. Um, but And not all court records are going to be accurate. Not everybody tells the truth when in that kind of circumstances. Um, so some of the information some people find out might not be uh, correct information. But you didn't tell who the dad was in this situation. I did not tell who the father was, but I did give enough information about him. I told his age, his children's ages, uh, and that uh, what kind of work he did. Why didn't you tell who the father was? At who knows? Back then, uh, I guess I felt I was protecting him, or I guess I felt... Because he was still married at the He time. was still married, and I guess I felt if I said who he was, then if there were ever any recriminations or anything, somebody... I mean, you know, I was only 21 at the time. I still wasn't as smart as I probably am today. You know, hindsight's <laughs> real good. Um, but you two still got married. We still got married, and I understand my youngest son was in college when Dixie came back to us, and he wrote a paper on um, siblings and their adopted or adopted siblings. And um, he did a good bit of research on it, and as, as he told me, it's very unusual for an adoptee to find that her natural parents have married each other. Yes. I would think that is very, very unusual. So in Dixie's case, it was a miracle that she found both of her parents. Mm -hmm. Because usually, you, that would be the thing you'd, that would make you apart. Right. You know, you'd just go your own separate way. And, and then the guilt, how did you handle that over the 20 years? That uh, Did you and your husband ever discuss much about it? We didn't discuss it because I became hysterical if we did. I just buried it. The way I handled it was just burying it and trying not to think about it. And every time I thought about her, I buried it a little bit deeper. And every time I thought about her, I buried it a little bit deeper. Grandmothers go into play uh, stores and when they know they have a granddaughter that lives somewhere, they go look at those little girl clothes. And, and as they grow, they look at those. How did you do that? I didn't go in little girls' departments. I didn't have any little girls at home. I had boys. Um, so I was able to avoid, I didn't go, I absolutely did not go in little girls' departments in stores. I wouldn't look at little girls' clothes. I would have nothing to do with little girls' toys or dolls. That was, that was my only defense. Um, I never shared this story with anybody until after Dixie came back. Nobody knew about her except my husband. And we didn't talk about it. We absolutely didn't discuss it at all, even after we became Christians, because it was too difficult for me. I just, my only defense was to do nothing. Uh, I prayed about her, but I did that between me and God. Um, that night, when you heard her voice for the first time, did you get hysterical then or before? 
No, I did before I talked to her because when Chuck first said you started crying. she had called, I cried and, and uh, was a basket case. Uh, but it was probably an hour between the time I got home and the time she called back. So uh, I sort of collected composed myself. Composed yourself. Yeah. Uh -huh. So we were, you know, I was, I was still very emotional, but I was not hysterical. How are you planning your life together now? And I know you spent Mother's Day together. We did. And even though she's married to someone, he went to spend Mother's Day with his mother. Right. And very unusual. And each one went to spend the Mother's Day with their own mother, which was pretty far apart. Uh, but how is your, your relationship is good, but how would you think that you helped it to be good? you and her I think what? we've worked at it um, it took a it took a while after she came back the first oh, few times we were together we talked about important things and then we kind of got into a, uh, a situation where it was you know the hello mom I love you how's the weather uh, that kind of thing and it, we didn't really talk about important things we didn't really uh, we didn't fuss or argue we just didn't you know how do you saw get through other. that barrier well eventually um, Dixie got us through it really uh, she had done something that I really didn't agree with and and she really knew basically that I didn't agree with it and but I wouldn't say anything and finally we were spending a weekend with her and we finally just sat down and had a real long talk and she we both cried and she said you're supposed to be yelling at me for this and you're not and she said an average mother would yell and I want you to yell at me and I realized that I couldn't at that point. You didn't feel like you had the right. I didn't feel to do like that. I had the right, and I was afraid if I did, she'd leave. And and we worked through that. And now when I don't know that I. But a grown I'm, person, no matter your own sons, you don't yell at them if they're doing something they shouldn't do. I suppose. Well, you don't really yell at them, but but you probably would say. I'm close enough to my kids, and I'm very outspoken. If they do something I don't agree with, even though they're they grown and married, it, even and though they're grown and married, mm -hmm. um, you still tell them. I try real hard, and I'm I'm trying harder now than I did maybe a few years ago because I have all these uh, in-laws now. Have they ever thrown and, it up and, to um, you? No. And none of the no. six children have have talked to you about what a horrible thing you did. We have um, Chuck's children have perhaps not been as receptive as ours in that now his oldest son was very very he made a big four by eight uh, sign and put it in front of the house when we brought her home that said welcome home Dixie and put a spotlight on it um, Chuck's daughter uh, we kind of had to finally work through with her just kind of talk through because she was the only girl in the family up to that point mm -hmm. and I think she felt maybe a little bit of jealousy because um, Dixie was kind of stealing her thunder maybe mm -hmm. but uh, we we talked about it she and I had finally had a long talk about it and um, that has resolved itself well you've given me a lot of things to think about and I think you probably have some of our viewers I know when Tony adopted Deanna uh, I haven't worked through a lot of the things that I've you seem to have worked through them better so I have a lot more questions to ask you maybe you do too and this is Iris Smell. Uh, uh, smell. Right. Yeah, I got it right. Steak and nail, smell. <laughs> and she perhaps would be willing to talk to you. Maybe Dixie, her daughter, would also. So I want to thank you very much for being with us. And I feel like that this is just the beginning of something that could de develop. If you would like to get in touch with us, I'm at 205 air code of course 582-0240 record a phone on there 24 hours a day here at the TV station it's 461-8148 and we'll be willing to uh, try to help you through some of this if you know someone that would like to have some help with and some prayer perhaps with this challenge of uh, unspoken adultery or children that are born out of wedlock then we've all been through a lot of things and if there's a way we can help you we'd like to do that and thank you so much for sharing this with me thank you and our you. people Iris Smell and I'm Bonnie Lippard <laughs> with me.
Thanksgiving in your heart and give Him praise. Give Him praise. Come into His presence with Thanksgiving in your heart and give Him praise. Give Him praise. Come into His presence with Thanksgiving in your heart and give Him praise. Give Him praise. Come into His presence with Thanks